Hi, my name is Dr. Jacob Dent. Today we're going to talk about special needs dentistry for the general dentist. We look forward to informing everyone of the different types of special needs and look, look for the opportunity for y'all to open up your doors and opportunities for special needs patients to get seen in your practice. All right, so y'all probably walked in, you were like, wow, that's a, that's a suit. Uh, may not be a great suit, but that's a suit. <laughs> Okay, so I was telling you the story about uh, wearing my LSU suit when I went to Alabama. And I, when I got the opportunity, it was kind of a, it was a little bit of a mixed emotion. You know, I wanted to, eh. but at that time, Alabama had been kicking our tail for years, okay? So I didn't have a whole lot of leg to stand on. So what I did was I walked in and I had this full LSU suit on. And everybody was about a crowd this size and everybody was like, I don't care what you're selling, what you're talking about, I ain't listening to you. Okay. So I took the suit off, took the jacket off, took the tie off, and I had put a cutoff t-shirt underneath there. Now, most presenters, if you look at them, they go, now you're wearing a cutoff t-shirt. But what, what you don't see is, I, and for those who I met at breakfast, I've got sleeve tattoos. So now the same group that hated me for having an LSU suit on, now thought I was a degenerate. And they were like, mm, obviously he's stupid, because he's got tattoos. Um, and I, I began my, my presentation by telling him, you hated me when I walked in for what I wore. And then you didn't think I was competent because of my tattoos. I said, as a general dentist or as a hygienist or your front desk, we judge people with special needs just by looking at them when they walk in the door. <whistles> Crowd stop. And I said, because you're so judgmental, it's not our fault. We're ingrained with that. You know, uh, there, is, there is a part of our brain that without even thinking about it, we automatically categorize people in one of four categories. Friend, this is a friendly suit. You think, hey, we're gonna go have a drink later and that's fine. We probably are. Uh, two, enemy, there was the LSU suit. Three, mate, okay? Four, indifferent. The problem is most of us are indifferent to those with special needs. If it doesn't personally affect you, you're indifferent to it, okay? My wife and I, we have a 15-year-old son, soon to be 16, that has autism. And I tell people, that is why I'm here. I didn't graduate school going, man, I want to be a special needs dentist. I was a restorative guy got a diagnosis, started going down this road, and went, man, you know what, there's a lot of people just like me that struggle going to the dentist with their kids. So what I did is I converted half of my practice to be sensory integrated, and I just taught them how to manage their own children, adults or kids, in the same way I taught my child. So today what we're gonna do, we're gonna review a little bit about that, but y'all have the opportunity when y'all go into practices to help the general dentist or hygienist who nine times out of 10 have never had any exposure to it in dental school. They just passed the law that said they have to start teaching them in dental school. Fortunately, there's no curriculum yet. Um, but the other one is they go, okay, we don't have any, I don't have any experience. They're afraid of it. They don't even know how to begin. So, so where we're gonna go forward from here, a couple of things that I, I, I do like to, to let you know where my background is. Um, I, I do have offices in both Louisiana and Texas, so if you get a little bit of the accent and some of the words I will say, we'll go, mm, yep, that's where he's from. Uh, I do teach, uh, I am, they made me a faculty member at both a medical and a dental school. I was like, are y'all sure y'all want to do that? That's crazy. Uh, but Baylor Medical School actually got a grant to research how to desensitize adults who had only been under sedation for dental work using the desensitization program that I do in my office. Okay, So I'm going to show you a few things that, uh, that we're doing with that. Uh, like I said, uh, I am a clinical director for Special Olympics. I had the privilege of touring with Dr. Perlman uh, who's the founder of the Healthy Athletes Program for a couple of years. And then um, I am the co-founder of, uh, it's called the Brush and Bite uh, 
collection. It's actually a toothbrush and a sensory kit that I invented to give to parents and caregivers and therapists to practice going to the dentist before they come to get some of those anxieties and fears out the way, okay? So before I go forward, um, I want you to introduce to the people that are most important to me. Uh, so this is my family. Um, obviously my beautiful wife Jennifer is sitting in the back. Um, the, the tall brunette next to her is my very 16 year old daughter. Um, and the one that looks like me, that is Ethan, okay? Um, he is dressed up because I have started a uh, dental assisting training program for kids with autism. I'm teaching them how to sterilize dental chairs. So, those are the other, the good and the bad of our house. Uh, I don't have to say much about that. That's just, that is Marilyn and Monroe. Uh, so those are, those are the two. So what are we going to go over today? We're going to talk about different forms of special needs, some of the most common ones. Now, special needs, for what it is, it's not always just an intellectual disability. Okay, that's, that's kind of the common thing as we talk about autism or Downs, cerebral palsy. Some of the other things that we need to look at are, are Alzheimer's and dementia patients, our elderly patients, uh, and cancer patients. Always a, I, I live in Houston, there's MD Anderson, and we're, we're surrounded by cancer patients. And that presents a very unique struggle for dentists because again, okay, what can I cannot do with this patient base, okay? So now that we have our video here, we'll get this, get this playing. Benjamin saw a dentist for the first time when he was around two, and it ended up being an emergency visit because he had had a seizure at our home, he fell, hit the wood floor, and his two front teeth had been pushed up into his gums. And so we took him to the dentist that we had been seeing as a family, and I could just tell by the dentist's body language and, the, and his assistant that they were nervous, and they weren't sure if it felt like they viewed him more of a liability, as more of a liability than, than a patient. So it was, you know, it was a little hurtful. After that, I just never contacted that dentist again. And looking for dentists, dentists that take our insurance and will also be willing to treat a child like Benjamin were few and far between. It's the adult population that's really underserved. There's a huge gap between children and adult dentistry for special needs. And for those that are intellectually disabled or physically disabled, most dentists in this country just pass the buck to someone else because they don't feel like they have the training or the capability to see them. The biggest issue that dentists face is just lack of confidence in their own, own abilities. If every dentist was just willing to open their doors and see one or two people a week, you'd be amazed of how the access to care would just completely resolve itself. And all we would need to do is just kind of open, open our minds a little bit to that possibility. So a few great things about that story. First one, did you see Dad? Yeah. Dad is my daughter Jaden's drum instructor. He's not like that, he's and I, was, and I was like, Gene, what are you doing? He's like, they just told me to sit there. I was like, okay, Gene, that's great. Way to be part of the, way to be part of the video there, buddy. Um, but there was a lot of big things in that. One of them is just from the parent's aspect. They're just looking for someone who's willing to try, you know? And, and, and here's where I get into it is, we're struggling finding not only general dentists who are willing but now we're getting into the specialist who don't want to see special needs kids either. Why? Because, you know, if you see someone nowadays, what I call the McDonald's effect, you see kids that are my size and they're 13 years old. That doesn't fit in a pediatric dental office, you know. 
Uh, I see the ones, I had one kid uh, came in and he had, was literally wearing a football helmet and boxing gloves. And it was like, strap it up, it's gonna be a good day. You know, uh, what, what separates a little bit what I do is I don't sedate my patients. I don't, uh, I don't believe in it. Uh, not for brushing your teeth, okay? There's a need when it, when it comes due if they have extensive work, but you know, if it's a minor issue, then, then we're gonna do everything we can to avoid that. Okay, so special needs. Individuals who require assistance for disabilities that may be medical, physical, intellectual, or psychological. Okay, so like I said, that's a broad range when we say you're a special needs patient. Okay, um, the ones that we're going to talk about, we already covered. Uh, you know, these are the most common. Now, there's a, probably no one in this room that doesn't know someone that has one of these. So we're all affected. It's not going away. And that's kind of the, the path that dentistry is taking now. It's, okay, well, we can't just turn a blind eye to it anymore, you know. Uh, the population's getting older, and what are we going to do? You know, uh, and the other, on the other end of the spectrum, our adult population is getting older, so all of our Alzheimer's and dementia patients are living longer. You still have to treat them, okay? That's still a part. So everybody know what autism is. It's a, it's a disorder. It, it's most um, known for its stereotype behaviors. So when I first, before my son was diagnosed, what do we think? Autism. What's the first thing you thought of? Rain Man. Rain Man. Thank you. You know, who wants to go watch Wapner? Where am I getting my underwear from? It was very much routine, you know. But you saw when he got into a big social setting or someone wanted to touch him, it was like, ah, freak out, okay? There are those, okay? Our son, luckily, is kind of on the polar opposite. He's got... Um, personal space issues, like he just kind of gets up there with you, you know, he, he likes his hugs, he likes being snuggly. Um, but they call them stems. If you hear, oh, they're stemming, okay? We all stem, okay? Think about it. Just because y'all are not sitting up here flapping and whoop, 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 repeating what Barney show that you just watched earlier that day, that's not a big deal. But I do it. <coughs> If you ask my wife in any conversation that we have, I'm going to quote a movie at some point in time. Okay? Yeah, we do it. Ladies, I can't do this really good because I have no hair, but you sit there and twirl your hair. I tap my foot. That's a stem. It's a soother. Okay? Think about it this way. How many times already today have you checked your Facebook status thinking in the 30 seconds since the last time you checked it, something's going to change? It is. So in that realm, everyone in this room is autistic. Congratulations. You, are, you have qualified for the, the diagnosis. One in 59 kids right now are diagnosed with some form of autism. Okay. Now, there are some relatives that go, are they, what level are they? Are they high functioning, low functioning? Uh, I don't like that term, okay, because that is very subjective to your own personal. There's mild, moderate, or severe, you know. Uh, so if you're talking about it, I like using mild, moderate, severe, okay. Boys are four times more likely to uh, be diagnosed, but girls typically are more severe when they are diagnosed. Okay, all the things that we've got to worry about with autism, behavioral-wise, translate into a lot of dental concerns. The biggest really comes not, it's not like, oh, you got autism, your teeth are going to be crap. I hope I can say that on that video, but I'm going to say crap. Why? Because they're, they're struggling with brushing at home. It's, it's just a, there is no two-minute brushing. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of times it, it is a, a struggle for the parents or caregivers to even do this. So you, you get a lot. The home care limitations obviously carries risk. We talked a little bit about that, you know, earlier today with Dr. Horst. Uh, dry mouth, serostomia. So now we're getting some of those products that we were talking about, what helps with dry mouth, eh, maybe a good option. Self-injury, bruxism, pouching of food, uh, pica. Everybody know what pica is? Non-food items that we put in our mouth. Tongue thrusting and hypergag reflex. So self-injury, 
That is one of the bigger things that we see. One of the reasons why you see self-injury in patients with autism is because there is undiagnosed dental pain. They're hitting themselves. It's their nonverbal way of telling you something's wrong. Okay? Pouching. This is a big reason why we end up with cavities. Okay? I know, I know our son, well, it'll look like for a while before we had to say, okay, chew, take a sip. Chew, take a sip. I mean, there was a doggy bag in there. It's like, I'm just saving that till later, you know? But those gum line decay will happen all the time. Pica. So we're seeing a lot of broken teeth, chipped teeth. I have one adult who actually chews Dollar General plastic radios. You know what it's like trying to scale teeth and you're finding plastic radio chips coming out their teeth? That's fun. Even toothbrushes. They chew the hell out of their toothbrushes. The bristles are breaking off and getting stuck in their gums. So, I always thought this was funny. I was like, that was me as a kid. I, I ate Play-Doh and glue and I only have minor issues. Drugs that use to treat autism. You will see this commonly. They're going to be your antipsychotics, antidepressants, uh, anticonvulsants, or just your stimulants, like your Ritalins, things to that nature. The problem is every one of these drugs has a side effect that affects our mouth, which comes down to dry mouth and every else thing that they have no clue what it's going to do to you long term. Okay? We had an opportunity where we had to take my son off of his meds for the summer for a small period of time, and when I tell you that boy went easy, crazy. He was like a crackhead. because he would physically come after me. That's how I knew it was like, something's off. Something's really off. But we have to understand that a lot of these patients that come into the offices, you don't know where their meds are regulated. And just like any other drug, they may be on the end of where it's not working as much anymore. So what happens with most of our special needs patients is they come in, especially like our adult group home patients, they come in, so medicated up because they're like, well, we're doing you a favor because obviously we didn't want them to misbehave. And you're like, I got this limp noodle. How am I supposed to do anything to understand anything from that person? So more is not better. And it just increases the negative side effects of those. So again, the side effects of those drugs, teeth grinding, dry mouth, sore throat, mouth ulcers, constipation. We're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, diabetes, weight gain, gynecomastia. Y'all have heard that with Risperidol. That was a drug that came out. Um, so it's, it's man boobs. You know, they, that's what gynecomastia is. Uh, movement disorders and heart problems. So here's a fun fact to know. Everyone that has an increase in negative behaviors, the most common two reasons why their behavior increases are constipation and undiagnosed tooth pain. And so what do they do? Their behaviors are increasing. No dentist will see them, so they give them more of the drugs that make them more constipated. It's a vicious cycle. Okay. All right, Down syndrome. Everybody understands what Down syndrome is. Very, very common. Um, it's a, obviously a genetic disorder. Uh, and this is our typical Special Olympic athlete. Okay. So... Getting involved in Special Olympics was a, a treat for me because I, I see these patients and everyone said the same thing. Nobody will see us, you know? The Healthy Athletes Program, we actually screen the patients and it, I, I felt like that dental monitor commercial because you go, you got a cavity. All right, what are we gonna do about it? Not a thing, but that's it, you got one, you know? And it's like, okay, what? So that's where items like SDF and varnish are becoming super, super helpful in some of our healthy athlete screenings because we can actually treat it in that moment for them atraumatically. And now, what do we do? We bought them time to actually get somewhere, okay? Find somebody. Um, just some, some random numbers on Down syndrome. Uh, you know, it is the most common chromosomal condition, but the average life expectancy is only 60. Some of their concerns, delayed tooth eruption, small missing teeth, increased periodontal disease, 
and elantoaxial instability. What does that mean? You can't hyperextend their neck or you could paralyze them. Why is that important? It's kind of important. But what if I just said, I want to go put you in an ER. I want to put you in a, an operating room. How do they have to maintain their airways? Can you imagine as a parent having to come out of going, well, we fixed their teeth. They're now handicapped. Not going to do it. Not me. Cerebral palsy. Uh, cerebral palsy is a very interesting one uh, because I kind of, kind of track that up to it's like being trapped in your own body and your body won't listen to you. Okay. These three kiddos, this is a great opportunity to, to talk about how this really affects them all. Those are all siblings. They were all adopted by one family from Russia. They were all kept in an institution. The two boys were on a liquid diet till they were of a certain age. Now I'm going to give you an idea. You know how old that green shirt guy is on my lap? He's 17 years old. He walked in, y'all, and he's, I thought my, my front staff got the age wrong. He was, he was, on, he was that tall. Um, the little girl in the back, Rose, she's four. They were almost the same height. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that, that story. Rose, Rose is my enforcer. That thing. She's, she's, she gets everybody going in the office. Uh, so their concerns, obviously a high carries risk from their seizure medications, because most seizure medications that you give to kids are laced with sugar, because that's how they flavor it, because it's nasty, okay? Uh, trouble chewing or swallowing, which is just a lot of the excessive drooling. We see a lot of that, you know, they're wearing bibs when they come in. I'm going to give you a little helpful hint on how to help with that, or one of the alternatives to that. Because um, what we don't want to do, here's where I'm not going to teach y'all any of this, is we're not going to say, hey, mom, dad, here's another medication on the top of the 20 that you're already giving your kid, okay? Uh, excessive gagging, some of that is because they're tube fed. Some of it is because they literally can't control, they don't have that muscle tone. And some of it is, it's actually their defense mechanism. You get close to them, ah, and I'm like, mm, you just, you played your card too soon. You know, I, I got you on that one. Uh, pouching of food, the poor oral hygiene, uh, and the aspiration infection. One of the biggest killers for people who have CP is aspiration pneumonia. So why is that important? When we're cleaning their teeth, and they have all this gunk on them, because they go, they're G-tube fed, they're not even eating. We don't have to brush their teeth. When they grind their teeth from the medicines, they break off that tartar, they aspirate it, now they're in a the hospital. Okay. Dementia and Alzheimer's. Now this one hits home, that's actually my grandfather who passed away from it. That's one of the most common things that general dentists will see and are seeing these days is the Alzheimer's and dementia patients. Okay. Now the struggle with it is they're still non-compliant, still a behavioral issue. They're just older adults. So how do you manage that? I thought something was interesting. Two-thirds of all people in long-term care facilities have some form of dementia or Alzheimer's. It's a large group. You know, one of the things that used to be in the 70s, uh, even into the early 80s, before you could go into a nursing home, they would edentulate you. On purpose. Why? Because there is no federal mandate for brushing teeth in a nursing home. So, if you refuse, if you decide, I don't want to be served, or in the case where you have dementia or Alzheimer's, and you physically are combated, they do not have to do anything. Now you're talking about a nurse's aide who's not going to fight somebody to brush their teeth. You're sitting in a messy diaper, they're going to do everything they can to get you out of it. But oral hygiene is not one of the big things for them. So we have the lack of cooperation, uh, the increased drug, uh, gum disease, the dry mouth, clenching their mouth shut and trying to hit the AIDS. 
So when I teach the extended class, I tell docs, you got two things that you fight in special needs. One of them I call the dental ninja, it's this one, and the dental clam. So how do we get people to open their mouth and not look like a, you know, a ninja coming at you with hands, feet, you know, because we all go, okay, well, I don't want to get bit. Okay, that's fine. Get smacked in the head once, you know. I had a patient, <laughs> it was an adult patient, came in and just literally fell out. Ah! And I was like, all right. So the male nurse that was with him was like, would you help me get him up off the floor? All right. Went to pick him up, and I guess he knew something that I didn't know, because as soon as he picked up, he did this. And when he did, that guy came around just whack, and just right hooked me. I called, called Jen in the morning. I said, it's not even 9 o'clock. I literally just got punched in the face. It's not even 9 o'clock. I was like, I was like I'm going to go home and try this one again. Cancer. May 12th of this year, I got diagnosed with stage 3 lymphoma. It sucked. I thought it was a herniated disc. Come to find out, nope, it was a tumor on my spine. Um, so, uh, not only am I a, uh, a parent of a special needs child, but I am now a cancer survivor, okay? So, but being at MD Anderson uh, taught me a lot of things. Uh, one, you don't want to be there. That's the first thing you should know. Uh, the other one is they're going through so much and their mouths are honestly one of their biggest concerns. At MD Anderson, there is one dental oncologist for the whole city of Houston, one. So everybody has to funnel through this one person to determine, do they need their teeth taken out? Do they need to have all their stuff done? One. So you realize a lot of people get left out of that one, okay? But, uh, not to, not to freak anybody out, but 38% of all of us will get diagnosed with some form of cancer in your lifetime. You live long enough, you got a shot at it. I hope I'm done with mine. You know, it's like, check, box done. But here are the side effects of the chemotherapy. Uh, mouth ulcers, dry mouth. Oh my goodness, dry mouth is horrible, okay? You wake up in the middle of the night and it literally feels like someone has rubbed sandpaper in your mouth. It is horrible. Uh, the burning, peeling, swelling of the tongue, uh, everything tastes like metal, which is, makes eating not great. Uh, uh, increased risk of infection and dental decay. So when your immune systems drop down, now all of the things, are, our hygiene's going poor, because obviously our mouth hurts that we don't want to do it. So you can see how quickly that can escalate. That's gas and fire. So where do we begin? That's my little logo. I wear it on all my shirts. My tattoo artist drew that for me, so it's kind of become my, my, uh, it's my autism warrior. So uh, when I take all this fun, fancy suit off, you'll see my whole left side is a, is a sword armor piece, and that's where it's from. When I first started, I didn't get my first tattoo till I was 35, so it wasn't like an 18-year-old drunken stupor. Um, but I actually, I got it in... Uh, the tattoo artist is a patient of mine, he goes, you sure you want to, how far you want to go down with it? So people are going to go, hmm, like those people in Alabama, you know, like, uh, don't know if, I don't know if I want to be treated by a doctor with tattoos. So I told him, I said, when I went to Special Olympics, you'd be amazed at how many of the athletes actually stopped, opened up, and talked to me because they could see my tattoos. And then they would show you theirs that said, like, Grandma, or whatever their dog's name was. You know, it was sweet, you know. Um, so I was like, you know what? This is the, the world I want to live in. So I had them sleeve it all out, you know. Uh, so now it's a really big, it's a fun conversation. You know, we, we, we usually get on that first. So how do you, if y'all are going into an office, and, and you're talking to a general dentist and a hygienist, okay, what are the two big things that we all fight? Time and money. It's the biggest negatives that everybody fights. So how do I work on my scheduling? Is I give everybody a rating. That's the first thing. Everybody who's new is a one, because I just don't know where you are. If you're somewhere between, I ain't got everything, maybe I can get x-rays, maybe you need a little extra time, you're a two. Threes are, 
you know what, you've finished, you've gone through the entire process of getting the cleaning, you can do everything, anybody in my office can, can work on you. You're a three, okay? I try to get everybody to a three because that means you can graduate to go to any general dentist because you've gotten the program done, okay? Um, so, so we work a little bit around that in the schedule. I roughly see anywhere from 16 to 20 special needs patients a day, okay? I see three an hour. So that's just kind of how we do that. So talking about what is the best way to begin this process? Well, the first thing it starts with the phone call. I have a special needs child, I have a special needs adult child. Um, do y'all see us? You have more people that have told the story that they didn't even make it into the front door and were turned away because they said that they had a special needs child. That's horrible, that, uh, that's ridiculous. Um, but further, what, what is the best thing to do? Do it when they have the minimum wait time. Do it first thing in the morning. I actually do the last two appointments of my day and I don't book anything else by it, okay? One of the things I always felt was a big miss, both medical and dental world, was we all go to the doctor. If your appointment's at two o'clock, three o'clock we may get back, okay? Or you're sitting in the room by yourself until the doctor walks in for five minutes and says hello. As a parent, I wanna be able to say, here's the things that are my concern, you know? Here are the things that I want you to know about my kid, not just sit down, shut up, open your mouth. You know, if you can't, we have to sedate you. That's kind of the typical way of doing it. So what do, what do we do is I give them an undivided hour. I shut my office down. That way if the kid wants to run up and down the hallway, great. I treat the parents' anxieties way before I treat the patients. And for the parents or the caregivers, once I get them on board, it makes my life so much easier makes their, their kids' life so much easier. Because why? It don't matter what we do twice a year, four times a year. If they can't do it at home, we're, we're just spinning our wheels, okay? Uh, I like to, uh, you see on there, have parent demonstrate the home care routine. Here's a good rule. If the parent can't do it in your office, you ain't got a shot. I used to do this one. Okay, little Timmy, sit down. And the parents like, ooh, you must be a bad dentist. So I figured out, hmm, mom, dad, show me how you brush their teeth. Little Timmy, ah! and I'm like, mm, you must be a bad parent. Uh, you know, that was just a. I was like, so let me help you. Uh, that's how you get them on your side. So what I did was I actually, I actually came up with my own intake form. Medical histories that every dentist has are different. Uh, but they don't have anything that's around what parents really want them to know. I want to know what therapies you're using. I want to know what brushing, flossing look like at home. What was your last experience at the dentist like? What foods do your kids eat? If your child's only intake is mac and cheese, pizza, and McDonald's chicken nuggets, we're going to have a little bit of a problem, okay? So when we talk about Carrie's risk, okay, let's understand that. Another thing, what if your ABA therapist who just loves, you know, to reward your kid with Skittles is getting great results? Well, yeah, but you're rotting their teeth out, you know, so that's not a great thing to do. So I incorporate the big team, okay? So there's two pages to that. At the bottom of it, one of the things that I put in there is I let the parents choose. There's desensitization, stabilization, or sedation. And it's not that's what we're going to do. It's just I want to know where their mindset is because a lot of them have only ever gone to the dentist and had their child sedated. And then there's a lot of fallacies around protective stabilization. Because if I say that, everybody goes, there's a white padded room, you're strapping a kid to a board and it looks something like a mental institution, okay? And that's a lot different. You saw in the video, I used a, a stabilization board and the kid loved it, loved it. Some of them actually request it. Ethan would go get it, lay in it like a sleeping bag and watch TV, okay? So it's how you present it. All right, here are just some of the fun things that I hear in my office. You won't be able to do anything without knocking them out. We can't find a dentist willing to treat us. We don't want shots, stabilization, or sedation. What else can you do? We read fluoride as poison. We don't want anything with fluoride in it. 
Before there was a few items that we talk about like SDF. That one, number three, we don't want shot stabilization or sedation. What else can you do? You can leave because you just took everything I can do out. I had no other options. Now we do. Uh, here's the dentist side of it. Takes too long. They're hard to work on. They don't get reimbursed for the extra time it takes because we're just GPs. The office isn't equipped or set up to see special needs, and we didn't get any training in dental school. Did anybody at any dental school get a whole lot of special needs training? I know I did. <laughs> okay, all right. The one specialist in the room. So this is where the first conversation goes. Mom, Dad, how's brushing going? And I will tell you as a parent of a special needs child, we lie. <laughs> it's going great. Ethan's super product, you know, productive. He does a lot of self-brushing. Uh, can't complain. I say, show me. And it looks like that. <laughs> yeah. And there is usually some child on the floor in a you know, full Nelson headlock with mom and dad going, this is, this is what it usually looks like. Or the ones that say, we don't like stabilization. And I say, well, show me what it looks like. And they literally have their kid in a full headlock, pressed against the side of the sink, just ramming it in there. They're like, their gums bleed a little bit. I'm like, oh, no kidding, you know? When you ask about flossing, this is the normal response. You're like, you grow a third eye out your forehead. They look at you stupid. I think there's no chance at flossing. So we had to figure that out. Now, here's a good rule to remember. If your child or adult child cannot tie their own shoes, they do not have the dexterity to roll a toothbrush to get the sides. They can, what I call hacksaw, but they can't get every side. So the parent or caregiver should always go behind them and get a little extra, okay? So the treatment options that we deal with, desensitization, protective medical stabilization, or sedation. For today's purposes, I will just talk on desensitization. Uh, it's a behavioral therapy that's on conditioning and reinforcement. We all do it. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of the behaviors that we have are based off of conditioning from events that we've done over and over again. Okay? So this is actually my waiting room. I took it. Uh, this, was, this was actually a pediatric office that I own next door to my practice, and I converted it to a sensory integrated office. Uh, I always point out the shovel on the wall is that award that I won with the Benjamin suit. It is not uh, the last resort when behavior goes bad, okay? Uh, this is my operatory. So a couple of fun things that I designed in here was I put a ortho bench in there because kids with the, uh, autism especially, if you try to lean them back, it freaks them out. So if they already just go in and lay down, that's one thing. Uh, I put a mobile cart in the middle for our handicapped patients that are in wheelchairs. Also for the kids that won't sit in a chair, we sit on that rug or uh, as a good Louisiana boy, I actually have a blow up canoe. I just sit them in the canoe um, and usually they go, I don't want to go to the back, but they'll play in the canoe. So then I just drag the little butts to the room. <laughs> That's how I clean their teeth in there. Okay. Uh, I may be the only office that actually has a trampoline. Uh, why is that? Because sometimes they just need to bounce one out, okay? It's better for them to get their energy out while they're still in the chair, but we actually want to graduate them to a regular dental chair. That's how you become a three in my office, okay? You have to be able to sit. This is another one of my offices uh, in Louisiana, and again, this is just a regular room. I just chose not to put a chair in there. I put a beanbag, some toys, and against the wall where the beanbag is, there's an iPad with just some games on it. They will sit in that beanbag and play the games. It's a distraction. Then what do I do? I take the beanbag, I move the beanbag to a dental chair. And eventually I take the beanbag away. Now they're in a dental chair. That's how you get them to sit in the dental chair. If you teach a parent and a caregiver to always have their child sit when they brush their teeth, then it conditions them that when someone else brushes my teeth, I have to sit down. I have some adults that still, at this point, we have to stand up and try to clean their teeth. For the hygienist in this room, you can imagine how fun that is. So sensory room items. 
again, toys. We, we pretty much took every annoying toy that Ethan had and moved it to my office. Anything that made sound. If you're a parent, you understand those toys that usually grandparents or aunts or uncles give you, and you tell them, if you do that again, I'll burn your house down, okay? Those are all at my office now. This is what uh, I invented. And uh, like I said, I, I, I give full disclosure, this is mine. Uh, but what did we find in general dentistry was you can't go to the dentist every day to practice. So as a special needs patient, what do you get that insurance pays for that actually is proven to work is ABA therapy. So what I, everybody know what ABA therapy, applied behavioral analysis, okay? For those who aren't real familiar with it, it's like dog training for humans, okay? It's just repetitive. You take a, you take a uh, task like brushing teeth and you break it down step by step. So what I did is I created a kit that went through a lot of the things that we do in a basic uh, exam and x-ray and hygiene program, and I put it in one kit for them to practice at their schools, okay? So that it wasn't the first time they saw it when they came to my office. So again, just basic items. One of the struggles that we find is x-rays, right? Okay, we could brush their teeth, we could do this thing, but x-rays are something that is struggling that we find. So, I put a little fluoride tray in there. You take a fluoride tray, cut that in half, tell them to bite on it for five seconds, and it teaches them how to hold the x-ray film. It's easy. All right, social stories. Social stories are just the pictorial of what we're going to do in the office. So we created a social story of step-by-step. -step. And you're done. I know that was fast, but the goal is you go, okay, start to finish. What do I do? I have that in a PDF file. I'll send it to the parent or the teacher. They know my face now. They know exactly step by step. They have a kit. When they come to me, should just be walking the park. If, they, if I know where they are on that social story, maybe they won't even sit in a chair. That's the homework. That's how I know what we do next. Consistency is key. Everybody's got to speak the same language. Okay. Therapists can't do one thing. I use the example of there's a mom that came in and she's like, okay, how are we brushing our teeth? Well, I sing the Barney Brush Your Teeth one, two, three song. I said, do you ever want to go out on a date with your husband? I said, because what if grandma comes and she ain't know the Barney one, two, three song? You know the teeth ain't getting brushed if that's all you got. So I do what's called the rule of five. Everybody can count to five and it breaks it into small little routines. Okay. Therapist inclusion, really big for me. Uh, this is actually the little guy's therapist down here. He's actually taking pictures of what we're doing so he can include that in his therapies. So he sees us doing it. And then sister up top, uh, modeling. If they have a, a neurotypical sibling, bring them with them. It's a great way to model. Uh, parent inclusion, I do not believe in mom, dad, y'all stay up front. Okay, that's my personal, that's like you're taking Michael Jordan off your team. They know their kid better than anybody else. Now that doesn't mean we don't have helicopter parents. Okay, so if y'all got this one, like, open your mouth, mom says, open your mouth, and you're like, unless your child don't speak English, I got this one, okay? Okay, so options for preventive and restorative need. Uh, prevention's priority, that's what we repeat, we, we preach. Uh, I see everybody every three months until they can graduate to a three. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give kudos to Andre for this one. She came to my office and spoke, and she dropped this little piece of knowledge and blew the minds of everybody in my office. Nobody in my office knew that the two minutes of brushing was not because that's what the toothbrush company said you had to do. That's why they set the bar for two minutes. You'd be amazed of how much um, certain products that I sell now because two minutes doesn't exist in special needs dentistry because of that statement right there. So thank you, Andre, for that one. So here's the rule of five. It comes into all of our kits, but basically one, two, three, four, five, switch quadrants, one, two, three, four, five. You can do that. So if you think about it, that's 25 seconds, right? Do it again. Do it again. As long as they do it, one, two, three, four, five. Hey, great, high five. Positive affirmation, move on, okay? Then eventually you can extreme, uh, extend that to longer time. So we know about everybody in this room 
has had that conversation about fluoride and why it's the devil for special needs patients, right? It's a neurotoxin. If they swallow it, it's going to cause digestive issues. They already have leaky gut. Well, what about the sensory issues for it, the varnish? Oh, my God. You paint varnish on some of these kids' teeth, and then they're wiping it all over your chairs, all over their clothes. It's horrible. This is, this is just a quick picture, example of the table that's at my office. These are just the things that I use as my armamentarium for parents and caregivers, okay? We use three-sided toothbrushes to combat the inability to roll a toothbrush. Um, I actually uh, invented a manual version of that that has a built-in bite block on the back end to help with the clam so caregivers can actually open their mouths and, and get uh, that done in the back. Obviously, we have already talked, we all know about the smart technique, uh, but there's Rose, little girl from the CP picture. When I tell you her mouth is trashed, they didn't have any health care where they came from. Mom said she had seven surgeries the first year I saw her, so we didn't want to sedate again to put her in with an uh, OR and a specialist. So we did SDF on hers. The day she walked in, we were just going to stabilize her, right? The day she walked in, mom said, we have a problem. Her sutures from her back surgery opened up. She can't lay down. So we did it just like that. Mom sat there. Mom was my uh, stabilization board. We used a little bite block and got them all treated, okay? So special needs dentistry is not necessarily easy. Uh, it definitely requires a lot of improv improvising when it comes down to it. Uh, this was a 13-year-old that got sent to my office uh, that was diagnosed with a root canal in the crown. We treated it with just SDF and glass ionomer, and that's two years from then. Okay, I'm going to preface this by this is, this is the alternative treatments that are available out there. Botox. Okay, we have a lot of our adults that you can hear coming down the hall. You're not going to get a, a night guard impression on those. So Botox injection into their masseters will help alleviate some of that and protect their teeth. Okay? The other one is Botox into their salivary glands will help the CP patients who are excessive droolers. Will dry them up. How many in Florida have seen everybody, even gas stations now, are selling CBD oil? Okay? CBD oil is a very good uh, alternative, natural alternative, to some of the things that we have uh, deal with in form of behaviors. Uh, so it's a mild pain reliever, reduces anxiety and depression. Uh, it alleviates cancer-related symptoms, the nausea, okay? Nausea sucks, it's cancer. Uh, it does have neuroprotective properties, and it has antipsychotic effects, okay? Now, this I thought was funny. I'm going to read this to you real quick because I know it's probably hard to read with the lights on. This is according to Bernard Remlin, founder of the Autism Society of America and former director of the Autism Research Institute. Of all the drugs, the psychotropic drugs, ex uh, example Risperidol, are among the least useful and most dangerous, and the benefit-risk profile of medical marijuana seems fairly benign in comparison. The reports are, we are seeing from parents indicate that medical marijuana often works when no other treatments, drugs, non-drugs have helped. You will see this more and more. Medical marijuana is going to become more and more uh, involved in special needs because they're running out of drugs to try. I think we've tried pretty much every drug that is out there for our son, and he's only 15. And eventually, they run a tolerance to it. All right, so in closing, the, the helpful hints, consistency and routine are, uh, are key. Schedule patients when is best uh, for them, it's like if they take their medicine in the morning, don't schedule them in, in the afternoon. You know, do it when they're at their prime. Uh, but uh, always stay in front of the patient. Here's the problem that dentists and hygienists have. We slide our patients staring at the wall. We slide in from the back, put a mask on, put gloves on, put an interrogating light in your eye, and we come at you like this. That is not, you know, conducive to a very good first visit. Uh, and understand, not every visit's going to go well. It's okay to say, hey, you know what, let's try again. Okay. So I'm going to play this last video. Unconditional, 
Unconditionally, I will love you unconditionally. There is no fear now. Let go and just be free. I will love you unconditionally. Thank you all very much. <laughs>